रूप भी होता है नाम भी होता है बट देन देर इज अगुण एंड देर इज अ निर्गुण ऑल्सो यू सी सो so that is it so this is the this is the best the, to be able to hear me and not see me is the best option exactly especially because you are meghnath so you're surrounded exactly. by the cloud absolutely so you you know you're 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 surrounded by the clouds but your voice the nad is is uh, audible exactly so uh, it is, it's noise yeah so let's start then with your permission uh, yeah. so uh, lord meghna desai and fellows of the institute and friends it's a great privilege that the last uh, of our academic activities for our term which finishes tomorrow as you all know is this uh, talk in our distinguished lecture series by lord meghna desai you've already heard the topic of his talk which is global heteropolarity in the new world order I'll say a few words about the topic in a moment, but before that, it uh, gives me a lot of pleasure to welcome, as well as introduce Lord Meghna Desai. I'm going to say a few words about him, but I also want to say a few words about his book, which I finished reading Sunday morning. And, oh wow! Uh, and my Sleep wife. Sleep was night. Sleep was night. Great. It's a great read, and my wife was saying that, "Can you give up the book and do some other things?" Because I got the book on Saturday, and I finished it by Sunday morning, or I got it Friday evening. So I just read it through. So I'm going to say a few words about the book, but okay. first, a, a bit of introduction. Uh, as we all know, Lord Desai is a familiar figure on Indian television, especially. when it comes to election analysis and this book will tell you why uh, i don't want to be a spoiler but he predicted elections so accurately including the loss of nda and the vajpayee government uh, the return of upa where nobody knew that india shining was not going to be all that shining he predicted that right then he also predicted the victory of narendra modi ji in 2014 and in 2019 i can bear witness because both of us were on the same panel with uh, we on tv and his numbers though i i must say he was a bit off i think he predicted 243 and uh, i think uh, uh, the the government came back with a with a thumping 303 majority but it was then that i made his acquaintance and i must say that though he's a life peer he has never forgotten his and he has supped with prime ministers and presidents and so forth uh, the book has photos of his with our current prime minister with the president with with uh, uh, dr manmohan uh, uh, singh and many other dignitaries he organized a wonderful talk by bill clinton but despite of all all of his great fame he also coined or was one of the main people Uh, to coin the idea uh, of the human development index as a different way to capture how well nations were doing other than just gdp so highly distinguished professor at london school of economics 38 years he taught at lse his phd is from university of pennsylvania and he taught in many continents in the world uh, so highly distinguished and one of his great achievements was the gandhi statue on parliament street so that's also in this book how he raised money for it and i'm proud to say that the majority of the funds or the large portion of the funds came from indian industrialists in fact rahul bajaj whose family jamnalal bajaj ji etc was associated with gandhi ji himself opened his purse strings to lord desai so it's a fascinating read but what i wanted to say is he's so down to earth he's so warm hearted he's a polymath and uh, in the eighth decade of his life he has taken to painting he does uh, acrylics i haven't seen the paintings but uh, he's a theater buff when he was a student at ruya college he was very active in the literary and cultural scene in mumbai he knew major writers such as dilip chitre they were his friends he was instrumental in staging ipsen a pinter and all the modern plays in mumbai uh, after moving to london he continued his his uh, love affair with theater and literature and when i called him a few days ago i said lord desai 
you're ensconced all by yourself in London. What do you do? He said, I've read all the 37 plays of Shakespeare again. I'm reading Dickens. I'm reading the classics. And uh, he's, he's writing a very big book, one of the biggest books in his life, I think. <laughs> it's still in the offing. So he's a polymath. And he has a special connection with Himachal in his younger days when he was in Delhi School of Economics. He used to trek in the Himalayas and he's trekked many times in Manali. He loves Himachal Pradesh. It's, that is also in the book. So he's a very, so though he's a rebellious lord, I would also say that he's a very down to earth and warm hearted human being. So I just want to say a couple of words about his book, uh, which is a fascinating read. And, uh, you know, we are all writers here, so we always think about alternate titles. So, Lord Desai, one of the alternate titles for your book is uh, Lucky in Love and Life. Because oh. he's, <laughs> he's had a charmed life. The other title I had is Not Out, in, Not Out at 80 and Looking Forward to the Century. I say that because there are cricket metaphors in the book. I have... Uh, you know, when he went to London School of Economics, he started playing cricket again. And he describes himself very modestly here as a useful batsman. Uh, and why does he say that? Because nobody could get him out. You know, he could bat through the day. And what is funny is that on the uh, sidelines of his cricket matches, he organized wonderful new courses at London School of Economics. So... Uh, uh, so that's a very fascinating part of his life. And here I'll read you two or three excerpts. So this is on page 125. He said that, uh, I welcomed any chance to play cricket that came my way in London. LSE had a staff cricket team. One or two were serious players and had been playing for county junior sides over Oxbridge Blues. The rest were moderately competent. Then he goes back to his college days. That Ruya, again, there were formidable players. Ajit Warekar, though a few years junior, is a good indicator of the sort of players Ruya got. It was only after I'd done my BA that I got a chance to play proper cricket with pads and gloves. I found I was good and managed to bat all day for my side. We played against another department without getting out. At Penn, again, there had been no chance to play, though there were, a cricket, there were cricket teams playing in Philadelphia. So... He says that he was a useful batsman. He also tried his hand later at bowling. So this is an enjoyable part of the book, you know, of how he uh, played cricket when he was at LSE. I want to read you another very fascinating part of the book, you know, where uh, uh, he goes through, you know, he was at a very exciting juncture at LSE in 67, when the student protests broke out in Paris, there were anti-Vietnam protests in the US. And Lord Desai was very much a leftist, a socialist, a member of the Labour Party. He was good at campaigning and uh, planning elections, but he was always a maverick. So he contributed with the so-called right-wing economic historian Dharma Kumar in the Cambridge Economic History of India. And he was slammed by all the leftists for doing that. So he's not just a rebellious lord. I would call him a maverick lord. So I want to talk about, uh, you know, the troubles at LSE, where uh, he was then elected the honorary president of the LSE Student Union, you know, uh, and uh, was very much a part of demonstrations. At one time near Trafalgar Square, he was cornered in a small garden, corner garden, and then he vowed never to join demonstrations. But... Uh, quietly do his work uh, as he knew best, which was by reading. Uh, <laughs> now, I, I want to also point to another wonderful passage when, uh, you know, he spent some time at the Delhi School of Economics. Amartya Sen is there. And then Amartya Sen is uh, hired by LSE for a very distinguished professorship at a very early age. And later, I.G. Patel, who was governor of the Reserve Bank of India and then seconded to the UN uh, became the uh, director of LSE. So London School of Economics was a very cosmopolitan, open kind of place. And Lord Desai thrived there. But in a stint in Delhi, he lived in model town. They took up an apartment there. And uh, he recounts those days. And there were great days for Delhi School of Economics. There was 
there were wonderful people there, such as Krishna Raj, Sukhame uh, Chakravarti, and a host of other distinguished economists in India, uh, Rinal Datta Chaudhary, Khalik Nakvi, Tapan Rai Chaudhary, Dharma Kumar, most of them, except the last, Asked Dharma Kumar were all left wing. And uh, one day he had this fascinating encounter with Ranajit Guha, whom we all know later as the founder of subaltern studies. Of course, Professor Guha was then at the Delhi School of Economics. He then went later to Canberra to ANU. Uh, but uh, one day he comes to the office of Lord Desai. And his earlier, his first wife, Gail, is sitting with him. And he says, Lord Desai, I want to have a word with you. Gail leaves the room. And here's the passage I want you to, uh, you know, hear. So he says, uh, um, anyhow, Ranjit came to my office one afternoon, looking very serious. He noticed that Gail was working in the same room, but indicated that he wished to speak to me privately. So Gail withdrew and we were left alone. Ranjit then spoke very seriously to me. Some of us think that the democratic path is not the one where the future lies. And the time has come for some serious action. I want to ask if you were prepared to join us. So Lord Desai thinks that Ranjit Guha is planning an armed insurrection. And he says, oh, wow, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, there must be something serious going on. And so. Uh, he says, so I replied, that is, Lord Desai replies, of course, count on me to do whatever was asked of me, he says. And then this is what Professor Guha says. He then floored me by saying, we are starting a theoretical journal on the revolutionary alternative. We want you to write for it. So I think there's a delicious irony in that passage uh, where... Uh, uh, you know, Indian intellectuals thought they could usher in a revolution by starting a theoretical journal. So this this fascinating book captures a lot of uh, uh, these moments uh, which uh, are worth recording for posterity. I want to now mention one last uh, important moment in this book after which we can segue to our topic today, which is the heteropolar world. And I think this passage that I'm talking about uh, actually reflects, you know, uh, the concerns that all of us have about the new world order. And here is where you will see Lord Desai as a very original thinker. He, he cannot be boxed into any category because he starts, I mean, his first book was on Marx, you know, he wrote a very important book uh, on Marx. And then he went on to write a number of uh, extremely important books and yet he kept growing, he kept changing his stance with time. And here is where, you see, we are talking about the Cold War and a lot of people still believed that in the fight between capitalism and socialism, capitalism would be destroyed. Capitalism, through its internal contradictions, uh, would uh, in some ways collapse. And that hope continued. Of course, that hope then, uh, I think, turned into a delusion. So. Uh, Lord Desai formulated the issue in three different kinds of socialism. He said, this is on page, I think, 254. His formulations are as follows. Socialism within capitalism, which was the second international democratic socialism idea of humanizing capitalism through reform. Now, after the Soviet Union collapsed, if you start reading uh, the issues of New Left Review, that's what they say. They say bourgeois democracy has to be critiqued from within. So here's the position number one, socialism within capitalism. Then his second position is socialism outside capitalism, which is what the Russians tried and failed at. Karl Marx's idea of socialism, however, was different, says Lord Desai. He believed that socialism would come only after capitalism. So here are three ideas, socialism within capitalism, socialism outside capitalism and socialism after capitalism. And if you look at how the world events have shaped up, see, China has become a state-sponsored uh, state capitalist regime, you know. They have, the state has created private capital and private property after taking over, uh, you know, after abolishing private property during Mao's 
uh, during Mao's time. So what I'm trying to simply say as, as, as a prelude to our talk today is that uh, we have, some of us have lived through the Cold War and we have seen the bipolar world, the first world, the second world. And I say bipolar because the third world was a non-starter. Though the Bandung conference, I've been to Bandung myself and looked at the archives in Indonesia. They're very fascinating. But in some ways, it was a non-starter because uh, the, you know, the non-aligned movement did nev never commanded that heft, either in terms of military power or economic power, to actually become the third pole. But let's say it was a second or sec two and a half pole world. And then after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Huntington thesis and so forth, people thought we were moving towards the unipolar world you know, with the triumph of capitalism. And of course, now with the rise of China and the decline of the United States, people have started talking about a multipolar world, which would be possibly a more fair and just world order. But is that what is happening? Or are we seeing heteropolarity? By the way, this idea of hetero heteropolarity uh, was suggested by Ram Madhavji, and he said, please have a conference on this because uh, the point is that the world today is not just multipolar, but it has different degrees and kinds of power and agents. The UN and the Bretton Woods institutions seem to have lost some of their power and influence. Instead, you have private philanthropy. I mean, imagine the, uh, imagine the power that uh, uh, people like the Bill Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, or the Soros Foundations, or even the Omidyar Network have. Or look at the power of Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and uh, some of these platforms, so much so that governments are trying to uh, moderate and regulate them. Look at the power of whistle whistleblowers like Assange and uh, some of these others who can leak data. Today, we've seen that there are thousands and thousands of supposedly Communist Party of China workers who have infiltrated major organizations all over the world. This is the breaking story of today. So the power of social media. Think about the power of an organization like the Rashtra Swam Sevak Sang. It's not a conventional NGO by any stretch of the imagination. But look at its influence in government, bureaucracy, and probably all walks of life. So the idea is that we are seeing a heteropolar world with all kinds of actors uh, playing an important role, not just states or alliances between states, not just major corporations. You know, you know the top uh, 10 richest men in the uh, people in the world control as much wealth as 50% of the world's population. So in this scenario, I couldn't think of a better person to lead us through and give us an idea of the new world order than Lord Meghnath Desai. I must say that his family, the Desai family, comes from Ward Nagar, where our own PM was born. He has a very strong Baroda connection. Uh, he was raised in Baroda. His, uh, his family home was very near the Shantadevi, uh, I think, talkies. And uh, he went to the Sayaji High School as a child before going to Mumbai and then to the University of Pennsylvania on a foundation. I want to say to Lord Desai, Meghnath Bhai, Upan Vadodra no Chu. And Mara Papa Tia Kam Kartatha, Nanpan Ma Vadodra Maj Hato. And a Olympic Mahata, Nanpan Ma Vadodra Mahata. And a Manepan Vadodra Ni Ada Veche. So Tamari Chupri, Vachina Mane, Bold Anantayo. And I welcome you uh, from the bottom of my heart. And uh, the last thing I want to say about Lord Deka, as I said, he's a polymath. He's written a wonderful book on Dilip Kumar, okay? And he looks at the progress of India's independence, the political economy, and the changing contours of Indian culture through the films of Dilip Kumar. So he's a film buff, he's a theater buff, he's a painter, he's a writer, he's a uh, translator, uh, he's an economist of international stature, he's specialized in econometrics. In fact, his PhD was on the tin economy, but he's not a tin pot lord. He's a life peer, <laughs> though he has resigned from the Labour Party. Now it will free him 
to make some conservative noises uh, which he was muzzled from making earlier and uh, and and uh, i think point to some liberalizing measures uh, in the very crucial brexit transition thank you lord desai for joining us all yours thank you so much thank you thank you makran thank you very much aaj tumara gana gana aabhar and i will i will uh, i'm i'm fascinated from the way you have laid the uh, introduction for heteropolarity uh, i mean it's a very interesting uh, concept because uh, it is not just multipolarity it's heteropolarity uh, because uh, as you said you know, we we started uh, after after the second world war uh in a bipolar world a uh, cold war uh, on one hand there was america with its allies and there was uh, a soviet union um and much of much of the uh, sort of second half of 20th century was uh kind of described by that let, let me say this you know in a sense uh thinking of the world in terms of great powers is a european invention if i if i may go just back a little bit uh, uh in 1815 at the battle of waterloo uh the british along with the prussians and russians uh defeated napoleon and then they had a congress of vienna now the congress of vienna was where the powers of europe and uh, decided to restore french monarchy and basically uh put together to kind of run the world and uh, century from 1815 to 1914 99 years is called pax britannica i when britain was keeping the world peace uh gold standard was the was the basis of all currency and the bank of england was the only institution which was a kind of a global central bank rather like imf uh, is today and that that kind of set the model of how uh, the dominant powers wanted the world to be run that there had to be a dominant power which would settle the rules of international law the rules of international commerce uh, the basis of the currency and uh, that was uh, that was supposed to be a very solid uh, solid period throughout that century there was no inflation inflation was zero throughout uh, throughout the uh, throughout that century that century is called the long 19th century but uh, there we are in 1914 the world was started first world war started and you can think of the rest of the 20th century as a way of sorting out the problems of european empires you see basically there were maritime empires uh, where where the empire the, the headquarters was in europe but the empire was out there somewhere in africa or asia or or uh, latin america and so uh, england and france and belgium uh, and and netherlands all had their uh, empires abroad germany and austria had that uh, land uh, sort of uh, germany didn't really have a, an empire but austria had its its empire there germany was already large but a powerful uh, country so basically it it was it was a land based empires versus a, a sea based empires and then in the in the first world war uh, the sea based empires won uh, america came in uh, halfway through the the first world war and helped uh, uh, helped uh, um, uh, britain so that the allies in in the waterloo time the allies were the british the prussians and the and the russians now the allies were uh, america uh, uk and and france uh, and uh, the austrian empire was dismembered into various countries the hungary czechoslovakia poland and so on indeed what we call nationalism is really a 20th century product because although there were some nations before france especially nationalism in terms of a territory and a language and a sort of homogeneous culture that idea is born from the breakup of the austrian empire the austro-hungarian empire 
come the Second World War, the unhappiness of the Germans in not having their own empire and having to face with uh, face French and, and British uh, led to uh, the rise of Hitler and the, the Second World War was fought. Uh, the, the, the fascist powers, uh, Italy and, and Germany plus Japan versus again the same old uh, gang, uh, uh, Britain, France, uh, uh, US. France, of course, surrendered uh, early on in the Second World War. So the problems caused by the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and German ambitions on led to the Second World War. Second World War was over. We then sorted out the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the German uh, problem. So what we started after the Second World War was this bipolar world in which there was a kind of allied empire of America, NATO, the NATO empire, as it were, and the Soviet Union. Soviet Union was the last big Russian empire, the Tsarist empire, which had become communist. Now, between 1945 and 1991, let's say, roughly speaking, the Cold War lasted. And the Soviet Union collapsed without a single shot being fired. It's a fascinating story as to why the Soviet Union fell apart without a single shot. But I would say that it was really because uh, in terms of economic performance, uh, the Soviet Union failed to match up to the power of, of America. While the Soviet Union had very good armaments and, and, and you know things like that, it didn't it wasn't able to afford its people a proper standard of living. So what you have in the Second World War, uh, after the Second World War, is a this bipolar world, but a totally much higher level of uh, killing power of the weaponry. The fact that uh, America was able to explode the atom bomb and end the Second World War by bombing Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And then it became a, a nuclear race uh, at, at who was going to be the nuclear power. And very soon America was matched with the Soviet Union, and then we had the UK and France uh, and uh, to, be, to be nuclear powers. Uh, later on, China became a nuclear power. And the, the club of nuclear powers wanted to keep themselves uh, in, in this monopoly position, but slowly the monopoly has, has broken out, and now there are there are about 10 countries, maybe 10, 10, 11 countries with nuclear power, including India. And of course, now the only only control is on the raw material which is needed. Uh, the technology is all well known, is the raw material, which is, uh, which is uh, uranium is in short supply, and the powers that be, the nuclear powers control, uh, control the uh, uranium. Now, so after 1991, we had a, as, as Macron said, uh, we had a single, uh, single big power, uh, hyper, hyper power, as the French used to call it. Uh, the, the U.S. had won the Cold War. The U.S. thought it was now you know, the master of all it surveyed. And this is only uh, sort of 30 years ago we're talking about. The last 30 years have been very fascinating. Because while America thought it was the most powerful country because there was no, no sort of opponent of the conventional sort left, uh, we find now that the world is no longer well ordered in terms of two, uh, two big powers or uh, necessarily only nuclear powers or big powers. Think of it this way, that uh, what 9-11 did uh, is basically confront America with a totally different challenge from what it had before. America has a, has a military power and with very good air power and naval power and nuclear. But in Asia, for example, America has never won a land war. It lost is more or less lost in Korea, or it didn't win in Korea, and it lost in Vietnam. What 9-11 did was it opened America to a urban guerrilla warfare across uh, the world, 
without any particular political power. The, the, the Al Qaeda uh, was a completely modern uh, sort of innovative organization. What they call it was a flat organization. It had no hierarchy. It, had, it, it, it sort of more or less um, uh, gave franchise to anybody to throw a bomb and call itself uh, Al Qaeda. And it was a, it was a, it was a very fascinating. Um, it remains a very fascinating organization in which without a state there is a military power scattered all over the world which acts in a voluntary cooperative way and can can unleash a lot of damage but this also has a um, has a precedent when napoleon was very powerful in in the in the first uh, two decades of the 19th century in spain when the Fr French invaded Spain, which is sort of next door to France, the Spanish peasantry organized itself. Uh, and the word guerrilla, guerrilla is actually a Spanish word. Guerre is, of course, war uh, in, in, in French, uh, and, and it is a Latin root. So guerrilla war, the, the guerrilla was invented, uh, was, was coined for the Spanish. And the Point was, it was not a regular army. There was no hierarchy, but they were very effective in fighting a war. And the guerrilla warfare is a whole uh, interesting concept, which uh, in Vietnam defeated the Americans. All the American bombing and all that didn't matter at all. They were totally out outclassed by these uh, Vietnamese peasants, uh, and and they kind of uh, threw the Americans out. So. Uh, Al Qaeda is a urban guerrilla warfare which is global, because uh, it always says that the, the, the guerrilla warrior is very happy when he is in in the community where he belongs. It is like you know being disappeared in an ocean of uh, of you know other other friendly creatures, and then you then you are uh, go go and bite somebody. Now, the way the world has evolved. Uh, the the guerrilla the the the, the Islamist Islamist guerrilla fighter. I say Islamist, not Islamic, because there is an Islamism is a is a political ideology. I've I've written a book about that, uh, um, but I won't go into that. Um, so there is an ideology whose uh, whose adherents can be found anywhere in the world because that's the way the world uh, world has developed it's a global globalized world and the americans haven't actually found a way around that i mean it is now uh, less uh, less powerful than it used to be but but you can consider uh, from 911 onwards in iraq syria uh, lebanon jordan uh, Americans have been fighting again in Afghanistan. Americans have been fighting again and again and not actually getting anywhere. So on, on one hand, in the heteropolarity world, there is the urban guerrilla warfare, especially the, the Islamist uh, guerrilla warfare. But then the surprise uh, was, uh, again, as uh, 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 Makhlil was saying, uh, the rise of China. You know, again, the, the delusions of the Bandung Conference, where right, somehow the sheer numbers of the Afro-Asian ex-colonies was so big that it will, it will sort of defy or hold up a, a challenge to the two military powers. Uh, Pandit Nehru was uh, definitely fascinated by that delusion which he had, he had launched. Uh, at that time, I remember that the whole uh, the Indian ambition was to teach the world the lessons of nonviolence and, and, and Mahatma Gandhi and establish a moral superiority or the world. Well, moral superiority doesn't get you anywhere. Uh, you know, you, you need arms. Uh, but uh, I mean, the, the, the non-aligned movement was ultimately anti-American, anti-American pro-Soviet movement. And uh, it certainly didn't help India when India faced China. Uh, and they all ran away, and India had to go to America and Israel for for help. But uh, China, China's rise as a power 
is again a very fascinating story because uh, China is the world's oldest continuous state. It's not just a civilization, as India is a civilization, but China has a continuous state going back 2,000 years without any interruption. You know, the the dynasty may have changed, uh, and some, some of the dynasties came from outside China. Um, but China has had a single imperial state all its uh, history, more or less all its history. There are about 200 years of, uh, of division, but otherwise. Uh, and China has always thought of itself as Middle Earth, as the biggest power in the world, which it was until about, say, uh, early 19th century. Until about 1800, China was the biggest power in the world. Uh, technologically very advanced. It was, it was uh, fairly prosperous, a lot of population. Uh, India had a similar population, but it had many kingdoms inside it and no single power. Uh, and uh, the Chinese self-consciousness is not to teach the world a moral lesson. You know, that kind of ambition is very Indian ambition, sort of spiritual, moral, non-violent, all that. China wants to become the, the number one power of the world. They want, again, to be Middle Earth. They lost against the British in the Opium Wars in the 18, 1830s, late 1830s, and they want to get back. And the way China has developed between 1980, I mean, it, China wasted 30 years after, after the revolution, but we won't talk about that. Mao was a complete waste of time. But uh, China, from time of Deng Xiaoping onwards, this concentration with which China has developed and invested in advanced technology in a single-minded way, China has become a formidable uh, economic and military power. And today, the Americans are frightened of Chinese competition. They are trying to shut China out of their uh, of their uh, territory, Huawei, and all that, because China is threatening by outcompeting uh, America by its technology. And so the, 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 this, uh, the 21st century heteropolarity has uh, America as a power, and America has gone through a very interesting phase under, under uh, Donald Trump. I mean, you know, People think Donald Trump is a fool and all that sort of thing. He's a he's a sore loser and and all that. But one thing about Donald Trump was that Donald Trump decided that American participation in the global order, idea that America will police the world, America will go and fight everywhere and NATO and all that. He decided that it is a complete waste of money that America had spent all this money regard, uh, regarding the Earth. In the meantime, it had become sort of, uh, it had been losing in terms of international trade. It was running a balance of uh, uh, trade de uh, deficit with, with the world. And the people it was going, uh, was supposed to be helping, Germany and, and, and France and, and UK, uh, not UK, but uh, Germany and, and other European powers. They were not spending any money on their own defense, uh, even the two percent required two percent of GDP required by NATO. So they were living off America and then giving moral lessons to America about human rights and this and that. So he decided, I'm not playing this game anymore. Had he won the second term, he would have dismantled NATO. So America was trying to become isolationist, like it used to be before the First World War. And it's quite likely that while Biden will try and become the active, what I would call imperialistic America, I don't think American economy has the strength, that depth, strength and depth and to be able to be what it was. And I think what has shown 
that America is a deeply divided country, a seriously divided country, a majority which is unhappy that it is losing power, and a lot of the other people who have been losing fight now come uh, to, to, to sort of uh, earn its rightful place uh, in, the, in the world, uh, in the, the, the black Americans, Hispanics, and, 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 and the poor whites, and so on. So America is definitely not going to be the guarantee for world order. China is definitely going to be challenging America uh, for, uh, for, uh, for hegemony. Uh, again, uh, Macron Paranjave mentioned uh, the UN and the IMF and the World Bank. Now, those institutions were created by the Allies. In, in, indeed, they are not democratic at all. The UN is not a democratic institution because the five permanent members are veto. And and they basically, uh, uh, you know, they can block any any countries, even the majority of general assembly may say whatever it looks, but one single big power can can uh, block it. So China can get away with uh, with the concentration camps for for, for the Uyghurs, uh, because who is going to complain about, uh, against China in the UN? It will veto everything else. Uh, and and st st stop everybody else. So the UN is based on a principle of inequality, which is why I I have always thought that it has failed. It has failed to solve a single uh, uh, international dispute, Kashmir or uh, or Israel Palestine war or Cyprus. It it is it has never ever settled a single uh, single problem. It's very good in its agency, UNDP and and UNCTAD and and FAO, its agencies are very good, but the UN itself has, has not succeeded in doing one thing it was supposed to do, which is establish world peace. Uh, so here we are, the UN is not uh, not functioning in terms of world peace. Various uh, clusters, G5, G20, the Shanghai Dialogue and all that are all being created. You know the BRICS, which is a very peculiar uh, sort of association. Now, what's going on is that you you are trying to manage a uh, a world in which there are no more uh, uh, sort of dominant great powers as there used to be, but pe uh, military military uh, uh, sort of powers are capable of competing for uh, domination and basically that is what is right now right now going on now obviously uh, uh, in India as everywhere else people don't actually care about the world they care about what hard what happens to India in this heteropolarity world where where is India? Uh, and so I, I better I better come to that. Uh, and I have to say my my view on that is uh, somewhat stark, uh, uh, and uh, may not may not uh, uh, will 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 prove to be controversial. Uh, I think that India, in a sense, was in self denial after independence. Again, it has this uniqueness disease. It, it it wants to be unique. It just don't want to. It, it wants to be somewhere up out there on its own, the only one in the club, uh, to show to the world that India is fantastic, the oldest civilization. This that other thing. So that is what Nehru was trying to do. We were not only Nepal, we were leading Asia, and we were doing leading Afro Asia and all that. And ultimately, it did not have friends. You know, we found out in 1962 that India had no friends in the international uh, sphere, except that its natural friends obviously were in the West. You know, th there was no doubt in anybody's mind that India belonged to the Western camp. We, we prefer speaking English. We prefer going to uh, UK or US uh, for studying or even 
even when we want to migrate, we want to go to that. Very few Indian students went to uh, the Soviet Union to study, or but they all went to Harvard and uh, Oxford and Cambridge because we are naturally Western aligned, uh, partly because of uh, because of language and because of the British uh, uh, British domination, but also in in a sense this old story of Indo-European languages that Sir William Jones. Um, as uh, sort of argue, you know, that Latin and Sanskrit and Greek are kind of one family of languages, and therefore we all have one original ancestral, you know, community somewhere in Northern Europe or wherever it was. Be that true or not, what is true is that India, Indians, in my view, have never thought of themselves as Asians. They've always thought of themselves as Europeans. Be very much more about what the, Man uh, what the Guardian says or the New York Times says. We don't worry about the Asahi Shimbun. Uh, you know, we don't even know what the Asahi Shimbun says. We, we have, you know, somebody told me once that when he was in Bangkok, he was a journalist, in Indian journalist. He says, you know, I'm the only Indian journalist in Thailand, whereas America has several people here, and so do the Russians, so do the Chinese. Is Indian Indians don't want to hear about Thailand. Indians don't care about what Asia says about itself. Indians really worry about what the you know what the British Parliament is saying about about India, uh, and so India is basically a Western Western facing West facing uh, country. And ultimately, it will have to be uh, uh, in the Western camp. It's not going to be in any other camp except the Western camp. And this is this is one of the things that India has to admit to itself that that is where its friends are. Its friends are not not anywhere uh, anywhere in Asia. You know, incidentally, just as a footnote, the only Indian leader. He's not quite a political leader. The only Indian leader who was uh, who directed his attention to Asia was Tagore. Tagore is the only person who went to China and Japan on his own uh, and had a whole uh, debate with the Chinese uh, and the Japanese about what it meant to be Asia, what it meant culture, and the Japanese wanted to ban Tagore because he was too too pacifist, and they wanted to have a macho military culture. The Chinese also used to say, don't talk to this man, because he's going to mislead you into giving up military power and going for peace. I mean, neither neither Mahatma Gandhi nor uh, uh, Nehru went to Asia, you know, at least until, uh, you know, uh, Nehru until, until after independence. Uh, and what you have is, uh, you know, India is westward looking country and it basically will have to just go and find friends in in the West. And so in the heteropolarity world, what is the worst case scenario? I, mean, I always find that at all times, look at the worst case scenario. What's the worst that could happen and can uh, can we can we live with it? And the worst case scenario has been discussed lately uh, in in the last uh, last year or uh, fifteen months uh, very much, and that is the prospect of a a conflict between China and and the U.S. Uh, and uh, especially the, the with the Xi Jinping uh, having really started this uh, this program of reestablishing China as a Middle Earth. And he has said, sort of, this is you know, this is no longer the the the, uh, the gently gently model of uh, Deng Xiaoping, that you become powerful but don't don't kind of show your power. This is demonstrating your power that you are the top country, you have the best army, you have the best weapons, best technology, and and take the world on. Now, China, one has to remember, like all nations. Most nations have a theory that the territory they have is insufficient. There are other bits of territory lying around which should really belong to them. That's, that's one, one very basic part of nationalism. And the Irish, the Republic of Ireland, had in its constitution 
the idea that the six counties which now constitute Northern Ireland will have to come back into Ireland, then alone Ireland will be a complete nation. China has a similar uh, uh, similar sort of uh, clause in its constitution, which says that Taiwan must be reabsorbed into China. Taiwan is part of China, and Taiwan cannot be outside China. So one of the items in Xi Jinping program is taking over Taiwan. And I think China could take over Taiwan in 24 hours. But Americans will then have to fight. They'll have to demonstrate that the guarantee they have given to Taiwan all these years has any meaning. And so there will be a war between uh, America and China regarding Taiwan. But and this is where I think India gets in. It will spread over, it will connect with the India-China border war. Uh, American soldiers, as I've said before, America has never won a ground war in, uh, in Asia. Uh, and so I don't think uh, American troops will be able to fight in the, in, in, in the Himalayas. But Indian troops will fight probably with American air support. And, uh, and the Ch uh, American Navy will fight uh, in, the, in the Pacific trying to uh, defend uh, Taiwan. And it's a, it, it is a plausible scenario that one, one way the heteropolarity might end up is in that scenario, in a war in Asia, because the first two world wars were in Europe, a war in Asia of a, of a serious nature. Now, if it doesn't, let's hope it doesn't lead to use of nuclear weapons, in which case it will be a long drawn out war. Uh, in which uh, the main theater would be uh, on on the India China on the India China border, uh, and um, remember India China border is not just the Himalayas. And I, I was saying this to somebody surprised. What people forget is that during the Second World War, China was supplied with arms on a road which goes out of Assam into Kunming. Uh, uh, and it was it was built specially at, at that at that time uh, to to supply uh, arms to China from India. It went into China, so India is exposed both on the Himalayan side and on the northeast uh, frontier. Uh, I mean, I may be completely wrong, and the world may be very peaceful and you know Hindi Chini Bai Bai and all that. But you know, my my task here is to make you troubled thinking, not happy. I don't believe in leaving my, my, my sort of uh, uh, listeners happy. Uh, I want them to be troubled and thinking and, and, and reading uh, and trying to show I'm wrong. That would, that would satisfy me very much. But my view is that this worst case scenario has to be thought about, discussed, because it is, as of now, the most likely uh, outcome there is. I mean, there are minor problems like UK leaving EU and so on, but those are those are kind of from trade problems. You know, the whether the global trade uh, uh, system will change or not, and you know, if it changes, it will adjust itself. Capitalism is infinitely inventive, so it'll it'll manage itself. But uh, the geopolitics uh, is something in which because there is no single overarching uh, peacemaking body like United Nations was supposed to be. Uh, ultimately, it will be a uh, it will be a war that would uh, that would possibly uh, solve this problem. Perhaps not. Uh, perhaps we may be able to uh, have like like in the Cold War, the Cold War lasted uh, 50 years with no serious uh, confrontation between the two great powers, but it ended with one power collapsing on its own. And I don't think it's going to be China. Uh, and, you know, because I think the, uh, the way what, uh, what the presidential elections have shown in America 
is how deeply divided the American society is, how it has got lots of problems, uh, which are really very serious problems of class and uh, poverty and, and sort of um, problems with the education system uh, and so on. And America may just be embarking on its decline. Now, decline can, can last for, for 50 years. The UK has been declining for at least all the years I've been there. More or less since India became independent, UK has been declining. It is not an uncomfortable position. If you already reached a high level of income, you can decline very comfortably, get very civilized, lovely culture, you know, very nice, kind people and all that. You know, the, the, the angst is gone and you can just enjoy your retirement from being a world power. And that is, you know, of course, part of the Brexit problem is that some people are not happy like that. They still want England to be exceptional and great and so on. But it one of the thing about heteropolarity would be the likely scenario in which the USA uh, goes into gentle decline uh, in the next uh, next thirty years. So I think I have uh, don't know how long I've spoken. I should answer questions uh, because there are many, many more things I could, I could talk about. But uh, the world is not going to be a safe place. On that happy note, uh, I ask you to ask me questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Desai. I was uh, struck by two or three things you said and quite disturbed too, which is what you wanted us to be which is that the world is not going to be a cozy and comfortable place in the decades to come. And uh, one of the things I think you said, uh, which we still hesitate to say, is that in India belongs in the Western camp. Nobody in India uh, has come out and said it. Even our uh, EAM uh, keeps dodging that, that issue and uh, tries to somehow and sort of balance India's position, you know, carrying forward notions of neutrality and uh, non-alignment and so forth. However, one of the things that has emerged in the last, I would say, 10 or 20 years, and you should know because you got the Pravasi Bharatiya Award, is that the Indian diaspora is very powerful, almost like the Israeli diaspora. It's not possible for a major Western power like the US to be anti-India anymore. So if India and the US don't belong together as large democracies with shared values, it's hard to imagine where India will fit in, frankly. And I think that going back a little farther during our independence struggle, no Indian leader except Subhash Chandra Bose thought of aligning with, with uh, Germany or Japan. Even though they did not like Britain, they still felt that India's future was in the democratic liberal world. Uh, so this, this makes us think whether uh, notions of the Quad and uh, notions of realigning ourselves more openly with uh, the US are, uh, are really in our interests and perhaps we, we might do that openly. And one more point I had, which you didn't quite bring up, but I think it's also important, that the Middle East is changing drastically. Saudi Arabia itself, with uh, MBS, you know, the great uh, mm. crown prince now. I mm. mean, there's a wave of liberalism in Saudi Arabia and UAE. Uh, and, uh, you know, they are openly condemning certain ten trends and tendencies. In fact, they've just deported some people in Saudi Arabia who were using Saudi soil to mount mm. a campaign against India and uh, CAA. So like Singapore, which didn't want its Gurdwaras to be used during the Khalistan movement against India, and they just shut down these uh, dissident groups using their soil to attack India. That's up. Hello? I've lost you. I've lost your voice. Hello? I've lost your voice completely. I don't know whether you can hear me, but uh, I can't hear you. I think we've gone off. 
Uh, sir, I think uh, sir, we can hear you. I think uh, Professor Pranzape has gone offline. Okay. Okay. Let me let me let me more or less uh, respond to uh, what he was asking, and I think I can uh, I can respond to it in, in, in a way. Uh, almost a client. Oh, back. Exactly. oh good. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So I think you've raised these scenarios for us, including that dreadful thing that we never talk about, a nuclear war, whether it's a dirty war with uh, extra state actors or an all-out war. So I think that you've given us uh, a lot of food for thought, and I believe we already have one question. Uh, I think, uh, uh, let me see, here's a question from, uh, doc, from Mr. C. and Subramanyam. Your analysis seems to be still based on older strategic considerations like financial and military power, and seems to ignore new issues like climate change and sourcing raw material from indigenous people. Though I think you mentioned raw material very definitely. I heard you speak of yes. raw material, uranium. Anyhow, do you think these two issues will impact geopolitics? So we already have the first question for you, sir. I think, you know, uh, issues like climate change, it's not that they are unimportant, but they are, they presume a high degree of cooperation between the nations in the international system. And I also have to say that you know you have to take all these uh, promises to do something by day after tomorrow with a large pinch of salt. You know, I remember in 1971, there was a conference at Stockholm where people were saying, there's one more week to save the world, otherwise the world is going to sink. You know, I've, I've had 50 years of the climate change uh, and, and the urgency of climate change. Uh, I, I have, I'm, I'm very skeptical, very skeptical that the Paris conference is going to succeed. Anyway, uh, that, that's neither here nor there. But climate change is a, a global threat, but there are intra-global tensions which cannot be forgotten. It is not going to be ever the case that China and USA would say, you know, we really ought to worry about climate change and not about uh, who is going to be technological leader in, in, in cyber warfare. Uh, I, do, I, don't think, I don't think that's going to happen. And so, uh, yes, the idealistic uh, challenge is there of climate change and of lots of uh, things like that but you know, i'm i'm here not to not to make you happy i'm here to make you unhappy uh because i want to uh, talk about reality and i think what what uh, what you were saying uh, my friend is right yes india definitely belongs to uh the western camp there, there's never been any doubt in my mind uh, uh, you know i i also have a slightly unorthodox view which i ought to say something now because then it will start another um uh, sort of, you know, hair, um, which is when Buddhism left India, India left Asia. Uh, Buddhism left India in the end of the first millennium of the common era, more or less. Um, India left Asia. Uh, and uh, India aligned itself uh, with the West uh, that, that, that long ago. But that's, that's, a, that's a story we can, we can think about another way. No, my, my view is that uh, the conflict of power, conflict of material interests, uh, you know, say you, you mentioned rare, rare materials, rare earths, and, and the, the way China is, is, uh, is going into these rare, rare materials, uh, and Americans are suddenly finding they're no longer the top, top dogs. Uh, you know, that is where wars are going to be. Uh, and whatever whatever facade is put on about uh, uh, about peace and human rights and all that, that is where it's going to be. Now, I, can, I consider the Middle East uh, to be in transition. I do not think that the Saudi uh, uh, royalty is is permanent. Uh, I mean, you know, it it may seem very 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 powerful right now, but given the collapse in the oil price. Uh, which is likely to be a uh, longer, longer run than than, than we think. Uh, I, you know, it's it's very rare for for a monarchy to have survived this long in the Middle East, uh, because you know 
uh, the previous monarchies which were there in, in Egypt and Egypt and Syria and Iraq and uh, I mean Jordan is still there, but uh, they they've gone and uh, so we will see uh, because uh, eventually um, they are there are tension in in Saudi Arabia. I, I won't go into, but uh, so thinking from the Indian perspective, which is what we were doing, I think. The diaspora has a problem uh, that ultimately people will say, where do you belong? Are you American or are you Indian? You see, uh, Kamala Harris is a very interesting example of this. You see, people have all sorts of hopes of Kamala Harris. That Kamala Harris would be with, with India, you know. Kamala Harris will not necessarily be with India, not the India that uh, that we take it as India. Uh, and I think uh, I'm I'm certainly sure that on problems like uh, like Kashmir, uh, Biden will not walk the plank, as Trump did, and Kamala Harris is not going to be helpful. I know I, I've I know her parents, and I knew her when she was one year old. So I can't say I, I know her, but I know the culture, the left culture she comes from, and uh, she's not going to be uh, she's not going to be on on India's side as much as Indians think. But also, if you are a UK uh, uh, cabinet minister of Indian origin, your loyalty has to be with UK. I mean, it would if if push comes to shove, Priti Patel or Rishi Sunak or Alok Sharma have to be British. Come on, the British electorate elected them, and while while we all would like them to forever ever Indian, and uh, that would be betrayal of your your uh, your democratic responsibility. I know it's it's an unpleasant thing to say. But one has to be realistic about this, uh, you know. And and uh, luckily, Americans uh, and Indians are getting along very well, uh, and in you know, long, long may it continue. But there are going to be conflicts uh, about about this man. No, I think Manmohan Singh uh, was the person who openly decided to side with America. I mean, that that is when. India and America have more or less a understanding, if not a pact, that what I call a just in case scenario, in case either of them is fighting China, the other will come to help. America doesn't have the numbers in terms of soldiers. India doesn't have the technology. Uh, and so um, China has both. So uh, India and America will get together uh, to to fight China, that 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 to me, and it's a very interesting story that when uh, George Bush and Manmohan Singh met for the first time, uh, George Bush quoted something uh, from the Bible, uh, from the from the Gospels, and apparently Manmohan matched in quotation for quotation from the Bible, and Bush was very impressed uh, because Bush had not thought that uh, there was this man who would who had, you know. And when one, you know, in a sense, uh, I, I, I'm very fond of him, and possibly one of the most well-educated and, uh, in academic terms, the brightest prime minister in India has has had. I mean, there's no doubt about that. You don't get a double first in Cambridge, uh, you know, otherwise. But uh, you know, and so he he was able to talk to um, uh, George Bush on his own terms, uh, and that is that is one of the secrets of the Indo-US. Um, uh, sort of uh, friendship, but you know, I think where else will India go? You know, because it is far too uh, big in Southeast South Asia and Southeast Asia to be able to get any help from anybody else. The only other thing is China, and you know, China and India have never been ever kind of, you know they were, they were never had any military uh, relationship because Tibet was in between. You know. Uh, until until Tibet became part of China, so uh, and I think uh, letting Tibet go 
uh, was a big mistake on our part. Good day. Thank you. I was struck by a couple of things you just said, which I found really fascinating. The first thing is when Buddhism left India, India exited from Asia. I think that's a really profound statement. And one can actually extend it in a different way because when you travel east, as I've done, I've been to China nine times, to Korea also around the same, Japan elsewhere. It seems that when Asia exited Buddhism, they also exited Asia. I mean, I'm just redoing what you're saying, which is to say that, see, nowadays they talk so much about inter-civilizational linkages with the East, whether it's, you know, how the kings of Thailand are called Rama and so forth. But actually, they don't care. I mean, by that I mean, even Korea, China, they don't care that much about the past. Like you go to Kyoto, it's, it's a city full of Buddhas, you see. But yeah. if you say, let's, let's establish our contemporary ties on the basis of Buddhism, no. So I, I think that even Asia is not interested in going back to its past, but they want to embrace modernity, uh, though it may not be the Western model entirely, like Chinese modernity is a kind of communist modernity. And we keep forgetting that it's a single party which rules China and it's totalitarian. So I think that Asian linkages can no longer accept as a garnishing, as a decoration, be based on culture and civilizational ties, language and so forth. They have to be based on real politic, as you said. Now, coming to your second point, uh, which I think is also really, I mean, actually, I'll, I'll leave that for a moment because there's a question which is actually just about this. So let me read out that question and then okay. I'll come back. I'll come back to your second point about uh, the diaspora. I'll just say one little thing. What I meant is that obviously Rishi Sunak or Preeti Patel or Kamala Harris, they've sworn loyalty to their host countries. That's not the issue. But it's going to be very difficult given that the people backing them in their own countries, whether it's Britain or United States or Canada, I mean, they win partly because there's large Asian Indian populations there. Then there are very important CEOs, CEOs of Google, CEOs of Microsoft, you know, of yeah. IBM and so on. So all I'm saying is it's going to be very hard, like with Israel, it's going to be very hard to have, uh, you know, a an open hostility between uh, these groups because there is a cementing factor. I don't mean that there is dual loyalty. That's not what I meant. But I'm only going to say that given the power of the diaspora, they'll function as a lobby to ensure or at least try that India doesn't become too, uh, sorry, US doesn't become too anti-India. So even Canada, they, Ontario has passed some anti-India resolutions because of a very strong Sikh, some even say Khalistani lobby. Yeah. And even then, the back room, there's always talk that, uh, you know, Trudeau's uh, uh, Canada and uh, Prime Minister Modi's India will not break ties because of that yeah. lobby. So that's what that's I mean. Anyhow, yeah, here's the question, Lord Desai, which has come from Dr. Chahal. He says, there was a stalwart, namely Dr. Ambedkar, who criticized Nehru while resigning from his cabinet in 1951. Our foreign policy is so pro-West, but ideally it should be best looking. How about that? East looking? Question mark. So, uh, you know, we've already covered this, but please, please say a few words about that. Sorry, I mean, I... I don't quite remember uh, Ambedkar's critique of Nehru's foreign policy, but it may have been there. I was... I was sort of, you know, uh, but, you know, East, when Ambedkar was, uh, um, when Ambedkar resigned, could only have in the Soviet Union. There was no China. China was not powerful enough to be a, 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 a military partner of, of India. Uh, and uh, the Soviet Union, we, we were, we were very proud. We, we, we bought all those uh, junk uh, MiGs uh, from uh, from from Soviet Union, uh, and the Soviet Union was our only military partner. So we very much de facto, uh, we may have been West inclined, but our military partners were 
were, 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 the, were the Soviet Union. Uh, and the Soviet Union did not help us in the in the China in in, in the China battle, so which is you know, which is I think when we should have immediately changed. And had Lal Bahadur Shastri lived, I think the biggest shock in Indian system was the early death of Lal Bahadur Shastri. Had Lal Bahadur Shastri lived just ten years as prime minister, we would not have had a dynasty. Uh, in, in India, in the Indian dynastic politic, the Congress dynasty would not have been there uh, had Lal Bahadur Shastri lived. And Lal Bahadur Shastri was already inclining towards America. You know, he, he suspended the plan, the four, five year plan. He said the first person to use the word Aam Admi in Lok Sabha, saying we have all these dams and schemes and plans. Does the armed army benefit from it or not? You're the first person to raise that question. That the whole purpose of planning had to be to improve the uh, welfare of the ordinary person. Now, that perspective went out. And we have always the grandiose perspective of starting factories to build factories uh, or whatever. And I think we lost 40 years because of that. So anyway, um, my view is that uh, we, we we idealized the Soviet Union very much in those days. I mean, I, I, I grew up uh, thinking not if, but when India would become communist. In the 1950s, we didn't discuss if, we just discussed when. And, in, and, and then the atmosphere was absolutely much more pro-Soviet than anybody now remembers, and I remember, uh, you know. Uh, even the de-Stalinization speech by Khrushchev did not affect us. We were all absolutely. And communism was a lot of glamour. Uh, and the communist critique of of uh, history, or some people like that, were very influential. Uh, all debates in, in Indian economics were in terms of kulaks and stolipin and things like that. We all use sort of uh, Soviet uh, terminology to discuss uh, economic uh, ideas. But then the the old system broke down. And the whole Soviet Union just sort of collapsed. Uh, you know, like um, you know, um, what do you say, a house of cards or something. Um, so uh, America somehow, from Nehru's perspective, Nehru's basically British upper class perspective, also slightly left wing. British were always anti-American, very snobby about Americans. <laughs> at least, at least before the First World War, when Nehru was there, he he picks up that culture, and he's always. I remember in the last visit Nehru had to U.S., I was in U.S. at that time, and you could see that he was just not happy in the U.S. He thought this is a vulgar country, you know, people showing all their wealth and so on. You know, he was, you know, why am I here? Sort of thing. Uh, and we paid a price for that. Well, not very big a price, but uh, uh, we, we had to kind of uh, rejig our policy. I think, you know, I, I still feel that India's problem is India, uh, not anybody else, because our, our uniqueness syndrome, we can't just be good. We have to be absolutely unique and, and different from everybody else because we have 6,000 years of history or whatever. Uh, and uh, it's yes, you can have that, but then you have to have the power to back it up. To have the power to back it up, you've got to be absolutely serious about economic growth. You know, and again, the, take just a 1980 to 2020 period when both India and China abandoned their old bad policy and started new policy. India has never been single-minded about any policy. That's the nature of India. There's no single-mindedness about what India is, what is its purpose, what is the goal. Take, you know, take three Indians and you will find two, two views at least, if not four. I mean, there is, but that is in one way the strength. That is why India survived without a powerful state for 4,000 years. It's ultimately an anarchic, stable country. 
it only, you know, I mean, uh, so there's an advantage there, but it has never been single-minded. No government has been able to single-mindedly march uh, the country on a path. Not us. That's not India. That's never been so, India. Sorry. Two, two more related questions, if I might uh, feel that. Sure. One is, uh, this is from Professor Rajiv Sharma, uh, who is himself a political scientist. He says, excellent talk. What role do you assign to the many polls that emerged on the global scene, like G20, BRICS, SARC, ASEAN, and so on? And he says, uh, how do you interpret India's look east and now act east policy within your theory of India belongs with the West? And then there's a related question from uh, Professor Hitendra Patel, who's a historian. He says, uh, some things you say need to be corrected. Nehru had gone to China in the early 40s, not after independence. Chiang Kai-shek had also come and met with Gandhi in Calcutta. If one is familiar with Hobson's work on post-1991 phase, uh, Lord Desai has not disturbed us at all, but it's always a pleasure to listen to him. And uh, then, uh, then I'll come to another question from Professor Rajveer Sharma. But so these two questions are about again looking east. One has to do with uh, Nehru's relationship with China, especially his personal friendship with Chiang Kai-shek. But some people say lost us the war, uh, and of course uh, the role of uh, Krishna Menon. There's a new book which I've read by uh, Jairam Ramesh on. Uh, the life of uh, V.K. Krishna Menon. And, uh, you know, if you remember in Bandung, there was this big uh, question of who, who would have the top suite, whether it would be Chiang Kai-shek or Nehru. You know, I've been to both their suites. And it turned out that Chiang Kai-shek got the suite Not on Chiang top. Not Chiang Kai-shek, Chiu Enlai. Yeah. Chiu Enlai. Not sorry, Chiang Kai-shek. Sorry, 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 Chiu Enlai. Chiu Enlai. Chiu Enlai. Yeah. Sorry, Chiu Enlai. But apparently Chiang Kai-shek had also come to uh, Calcutta and met Gandhi, so says uh, Professor Patel. And the oh, yeah, of course, of course, the Chiang Kai Shek, Shek did come to uh, did come to India. After all, he was an ally in the Second World War, and British India was part of the war. And and Chiang Kai Shek was very well liked in India. Uh, and I had not realized that Nehru had physically gone to China. I stand corrected on that, uh, but I know that when the Asian Relations Conference took place in Delhi uh, uh, before Indian independence, uh, uh, Nehru was wanted to say, have this thing, the India as leader in Asia and so on. And that's where uh, this uh, idea took place that there was a Tibetan delegation and a Chinese delegation. And the Chiang Kai-shek government said, that if the if the Tibetan delegation is admitted, China will walk out, because we do not believe that Tibet is an independent country. Uh, and uh, you know, there's whole history about what Panikkar did or did not do. I won't go into all that. But uh, you know, what what I meant by that? Yes, and Nehru may have gone once, but Tagore went and interacted culturally with the Chinese and the Japanese. There's a China Bhavan in Shantaniketan. You know, I mean, and Tagore was serious about Asia. Whereas, uh, and I think uh, Nehru went to Singapore as well and met Mountbatten there. But Nehru's visits after that were kind of official visits. Uh, all the Indian leadership for independence, they all study you know, and some inns of court in London. And they were all kind of Western oriented. Not one went to uh, anywhere East for studying. But you know, I mean, that that was that was the best universities at that time. I don't, I don't blame them. But uh, uh, one forgets that while we talk about Asia, we don't actually like Asia. On, on the other question about um, uh, G20 and so on, I think you no, know, they they partly arise from the failure of United Nations uh, to 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 offer um, a, a good meeting place, and partly also I don't think that they are all that effective. Um, I mean, it's all right. Then they, they, you know, uh, I don't remember anything the G20 has done uh, 
that that that's going to change change the world. But uh, I could be wrong. Uh, again, partly because the IMF has uh, become much weaker, you need some meeting for the economic policy and so on. But uh, ultimately, uh, in terms of global political institutions, uh, there is a deterioration. Uh, certainly compared to the hopes we had in 1945 of what the world was going to be like. And this makeshift arrangement like G5, G20. I mean, look at BRICS. The word BRICS was invented by Goldman Sachs. There is no natural affiliation between BRICS. It's only that uh, uh, a very bright person in a uh, in Goldman Sachs saw that these four countries were, were growing very rapidly and the stock market was doing very well. So he invented the word BRICS. And so now there is a there is a BRICS concept, there's nothing in common uh, in, the, in the one Brazil and Russia and India and China. That was what's wrong. Anyway, uh, if they want to meet, they want to meet. Uh, but that there's no solid alliance except uh, you know the military ones. As and when it is, nothing else really matters. Uh, now, what? What? There was something about history. Uh, have I answered that? I think. I think I did answer that. But uh, I think you did. I, I just wanted to say I was looking up something while we were talking. Nehru visited China in August 1939, but the hostilities which broke out in the Second World War uh, ensured that he had to cut short his trip. He only stayed there for two weeks. And I also found an article by Ramchandra Guha on this, uh, where uh -huh. he talked about, you know, the references to China in Nehru's mm -hmm. books, like the discovery yeah. of India. Uh, I mean, yeah. one forty references to China. And I was reminded of that incident that we hear via Vijayalakshmi Pandit, that uh, uh, it was India which was offered a permanent membership of the United Nations Security Council, because China that is, the People's Republic of China was not recognized at sure. that time. Sure. Sure. And, uh, and uh, Nehru turned it down uh, no, in favor of true. Asian unity. In, in favor of Asian that's unity. Uh, and that's then true. No, that's the absolutely true. And uh, I, I, I respect him for that. I, he, because uh, to offer, uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek could not, should not have held the, the permanent membership after he was uh, displaced. Let, let's put it first of all. And the only thing that India was being uh, offered just to keep China out. And Nehru took the view, Nehru took the view that that is unjust. And he was he was an Asian idealist. I, I have to say one thing, you know, he, he thought at least in the in the 1940s until uh, till he kind of, you know, woke up in 1950s. But um, uh, he definitely did think that Asia would be a power and India would be leading Asia and he would be leading India. So he was a great Asian leader. Proved to be not so. If there ever was going to be a leading country in Asia, it's going to be China. And There's I no think, doubt about that. I think Nehru underestimated that. When I went to Bandung and I was looking at the records, it's amazing yeah. to find out that one of the things that Nehru was very concerned about is if they had uh, flush toilets and WCs, you know. Yeah. And Indonesia was ahead of India in its freedom struggle. In fact, they became free before India. Sure. So, I mean, Nehru was such a, as you said, a British snob that, uh, and in, in 54, Nehru went to China for the first time as an official head of state, so to speak. Not head of state, but head of, I mean, the prime minister. Yeah, all right. And he had remarked on the night soil being removed. It was called uh, liquid gold or something because the farmers yeah, would come, yeah. you know. Yes, and, I, I, I saw when I was in China in 1973. I first went to China in 1973. And they pointed out to us how China was doing this thing. There were people on their shoulders like the like cavity, you know, you know the, the night soil. We're taking this into the countryside because the countryside needs this, and this 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 was this was still the, the method in China in 1973 when I was there. Now you see, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. 
No, no. <laughs> that, uh, yeah, yeah. Just finish my point. I'm only saying that Nehru had that sense of slight superiority, and he never got along with the Americans. And uh, even with Pakistan, he snubbed Ayub Khan so badly, which they say was one reason that Pakistan went to war. You know that uh, he he was just not willing to uh, concede or to give. Uh, you know this kind of equal. Uh, respect to some of these leaders uh, and had this uh, kind of snobbish attitude to them, you know. So I was just endorsing what you were saying. That's all. You see, Gina, Gina was different because Gina was a proper barrister. Uh, you, know, you have to remember that. Gina was a barrister. Uh, and I think the best lawyer of them all. In, in terms of a professional lawyership, Gina um, was able to argue in the Privy Council cases. Uh, uh, Unlike any of the other lawyers, no, I think it's a it's a, it never remains to be fascinating as a person because uh, you know uh, the way he determined a lot of early early Indian Indian history. I mean, I I grew up in 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 a, in a Nehru era. Uh, I sort of I only left in 1961, so about three years before uh, he died. He was immensely immensely influential, and he was much more. Uh, a presence in India than any subsequent leader, including Narendra Modi ji. Uh, I mean, there's no comparison because we actually have uh, film news reviews in in cinema, and every every week he was there in something or other, and uh, he really was was very very dominant. He just had, uh, like everybody else, his own problems. But nobody else has won three general elections yet. So anyway, uh, I I enjoyed this. I if there are any more questions, I'm here. I I'm willing to answer any questions. Uh, but I think you know one of the things is that uh, if the world is going to get more uh, insecure than it has been. India will have to play to its strength. And India will have to have good friends. India will have to have friends who need India's strengths. And this is where I think uh, uh, India and America would be would be a good combination. Are we gone? Is it over? Hello? Anybody there? Hello? Yes, yes, we can, we can. OK, oh, good, oh, good. So are any more questions? Any more questions? Sir, uh, uh, you had uh, stated right in the very beginning that after independence, India was in fact in a self-denial mode and was more interested in being a unique kind of a country, if I understand correctly. Sure. In fact, uh, India is a country which uh, right from day one uh, has been interested not in the use of military power, though historically, I would say, if, even if we go to Arsasra, that there was an insistence on on military power, strengthening economy, all you know the the seven angas of the state. He he insisted, and uh, uh, but at the same time, you know, it would it not be true to say that India is more interested in using soft power in place of military power to shape its foreign policy. You know, let me In say one. Thing. Let me say one thing. Uh, nobody in the modern world would quote an old Sanskrit text or old Latin text to justify its military strategy. Whatever Chanakya may or may not have said has absolutely no relevance to modern defense. Uh, I'm sorry, you know, I mean, India often historically never ever created an emperor ruling over all of India. Neither Muslim nor Hindu nor Buddhist. 
So India has never had a good military story to tell the world. And so its choice not to use our in is kind of, what else could they do? Uh, so, you know, I think India's, India's military power, this is serious uh, statement, comes because of the fact that the first modern army in the world was a British Indian army. The first seriously modern army started in the late 18th century was trained on Indian soil. British officers trained Indian soldiers and made them a power in the land. And the British Army's contribution to the two world wars has still not been fully recognized, but it was a fantastic, it remains a fantastic army. But that, that is nothing to do with Chanakya or, or Arthashastra or anybody else. I mean, it's a, so I think, you know, well, yes, because we have all that literature, we would like to quote it, but, at some stage, we have to say modernity is modernity. You know, we, we have to break up and say, for right now, for the 21st century, what is useful is what we in the 21st century know about military power. And the fact that India may want to have soft power is because India doesn't have any hard power or didn't have any hard power till recently. What choice did India have? And even in soft power, where is the soft power? Yes, the diaspora has soft power. But apart from that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm living abroad, I'm, I'm most skeptical of, of these stories. Convince me, where is India's soft power? Because at one stage we thought we were international leader in terms of uh, non-alignment policy and so on, played a big role in United Nations, all those things. But you know, it's it's, it doesn't really, uh, living abroad, I don't see India as being that important as people in India see. You know, it is like when your prime minister is speaking in United Nations, that's a big item in your newspaper, but in no other newspaper is it a big item. I mean, this, uh, this is true of all countries and all prime ministers. I'm, I'm not just saying in India. And so, you know, it looks like, oh, India is big, but I'm sitting here, India is not that big. Sorry. It has the largest population, yes. Uh, you know, largest uh, ex-colony, yes. Could be a big, big military power. Uh, Professor Desai, I'm intrigued by two major blanks or omissions in your analysis. Number one, you have completely blacked out European Union, uh, where Germany and some other European powers have emerged to a great height. And number two, you have completely omitted the possibility of the United States turning uh, away from democracy and moving towards some sort of dictatorship. Okay, let me say this about the European Union. I did actually mention that Germany and uh, so the European members of NATO were not actually spending as much money as they should be, as they were committed to, on their military uh, uh, and, 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 and their military preparedness, which is why Donald Trump was fed up of uh, Germany. The European Union is, of course, a great, great combination, but if you look at the thinking, they think they live in some post kantian paradise of peace. They're utterly unprepared for war. Uh, Britain and France are the only two members of the European Union who have a proper army. You know, whenever the European Union has taken part in any international uh, army, they have medical corps and things like that. If they go to Afghanistan, Italy sends a medical corps. No, no, no soldiers. So I think European Union is not a military power. Whatever else it may be, it's not a military power. It is never going to be a military power. Now that the British have left European Union, it's even less of a military power because a Britain, and, as I said, Britain and France are the only two military powers in the EU. Okay, uh, what was the second question? I forget now. Uh, the United States uh, oh, yeah. The United States will not be authoritarian. It will be divided and so on. You see, for a long time, uh, I, I wrote about it recently, 
United States, in it's called a secular country, comes for a big thing you know, in there. But it was a white Christian Protestant uh, majoritarian democracy. The white Christian Protestant majority ruled, uh, and in the last 50 years, uh, the non-Protestant, non-white people have been trying to assert their uh, their role and. Donald Trump represents the crisis of the white majority. It's doubt as to whether it can go on ruling America as it used to. And America is going to run into a problem, not so much of authoritarianism, but decline. As I said, it is going to go into a gentle decline. It will, it will stay one of the richest countries. We need has that. But it will not be the, the, the country that Kennedy uh, said we will go anywhere, fight fight everybody for freedom and for peace and so on. It will not have the capacity because it will lack the single will. Uh, that uh, I think Biden is more of an old-fashioned American imperialism kind of person, but uh, we don't know how, how much he will succeed. So my view is not that America will be authoritarian. I mean, its democracy is pretty peculiar anyway, uh, as we found out. Uh, I think it will be uh, it will be a rich country on a gentle decline as a military power, and it could, if it lost Taiwan, in, if, if Taiwan was reabsorbed by, by by China, America would be humiliated. Very simple, and I think it will lose the control of the China Sea. I just want to say one thing about uh, about you know you saying about Asia, uh, Macron, that um, how Asian sort of uh, view India and so on. You know, one of the things that Asian country, East Asian countries have done, especially Korea, Korea, take Korea, Vietnam, two countries uh, kind of you know, uh, scarred by war. South Korea became a developed country merely by serious concentration on following the Japanese model, helping its own business people to contribute to growth in a positive way. You know, South Korea and Japan have never suspected their business people to be profit-making and monopolistic and, and, you know, exploiting all that. There's always been a partnership between business and, and government. India has never achieved a proper healthy partnership between its business, the very good business people in India, but they never get their uh, their kind of you know proper respect. Business, all political parties in India, all political parties in India are anti-business. No political leader will ever openly say profit making is good for the economy because it creates jobs. Nobody says that. The only abuse, Adani's and Ambani's are bad, and Tata's and Birla's are bad. And, I mean, it's, it's tragic. It's completely tragic. It has kept Indian uh, economy growing much more slowly than it should be. All this, you know, why are the banks nationalized, for God's sake? And what a complete, complete mess uh, the, the nationalized banks are made, and still we have got nationalized banks. You know, Indeed, why, why can't we privatize these banks? Why, well, can't we give Air in, why can't we give Air India away? Or just stop it. You know, you know, stop losing money. You know, you may not make money. Nobody may buy Air India, but we just stop it. There are many other, plenty of other airlines to, to fly in. Why do we have to, why do, do Indian taxpayers have to go on making a huge loss month after month? What for? Apparently, the Tata they bid for Air India to the morning's news through their subsidiary Air Asia, and the government is trying to consolidate the banks. As you know, Dina Bank has been merged with Bank of Baroda, both banks associated with uh, Gujarat. And when it comes to Dina Bank, wo Dina ni lena hi ho gaya, you know. So, uh, anyhow, just, there's the last question uh, for you, Meghnath Bhai. 
And that yeah. is so Mr. Subramanian. He says that, uh, do you think a movement for equity and, and uh, justice and equality will play as important a role in uh, nations as they did in the 20th century? That's what he's asking. You know, I, I have to say, in my younger days, I would have said yes. You know, I've lived too long. I've lived too long and I have been disappointed often enough to say, I wish it was right, but I don't think so. I, I, I don't really have uh, much hope that the world will get terribly better than it is. Uh, if it doesn't destroy itself, that'll be good enough. But I don't think it's going to get a get a better place. Sorry, but that that is that's entirely my personal perspective, because I I was I did have high hopes of equality and socialism and and anti-racism and all and all sorts of things, and the world probably is getting better, but not at the rate at which I thought it would improve. But who knows? There's always a surprise, always a surprise that we, we may, we may yet. I mean, who would have thought, uh, in the, when I was young, that the Chancellor of the Exchequer of UK would be a, a boy of Indian, uh, of parents of Indian origin, and and seems completely natural uh, that it, it should be so. so. You know, so who knows? Thank you. I, I want One to ask one last question which is that yeah. we hear a lot in india of the 21st century belonging to india being india century and uh, given what you've told us about the weakening of the united states as the hyperpower and the checks to china that that are in the offing etc uh, and uh, also the gradual you might say loosening of the barriers to Indian creativity and productivity. Do you think that there is a hope that the 21st century will indeed belong to India? No. Sorry. You know, I mean, uh, I, I actually, if India does better in the 21st than it did in the 20th century or the second half of 20th century, I'd be very pleased. If India manages to eliminate poverty, improve health, improve education, stop uh, feticide, improve women's position, uh, you know, improve the position of Dalit women especially, uh, I would be very pleased. But whether, whether a century, you know, in a way you could say every century has belonged to India. Huh. Why not? You know, we have we have things to record in every century from the beginning of time. Uh, but in the sense of modern uh, modern parlance, no, I don't think so. Uh, India, I, I I remember writing a writing a paper which came out uh, tw tw twenty years ago on India-China comparison for an IMF conference, which ended up saying. China will be a great economy. India will be a great society. Um, I, India, if India still shows that it can be a democracy with all the all the diversity it has and all the problems it has, that is one of the greatest successes of all centuries. No other country started began life as a democracy with full adult franchise, universal adult franchise. No country. India is the only country which started like and has maintained that, has maintained elections, whatever the quality of politicians we have. And I think that is India's great triumph. In no other country compares. I mean, European Union uh, is half the size of, uh, of India and still has problems uh, about its democracy. So India, I think, already has that position which no other country will match the largest democracy for the longest period of time. Uh, you know, it's that's to, to have 900 million voters is staggering. And to continue holding elections under all circumstances, 
without fail and have whatever it is, 50 political parties. Uh, I think that, that's, that's a great achievement. That is one of the greatest achievements in, in, in human history. So I think from that point of view, India, India has a very good thing to be proud of. And that is why I think, you know, India undersells itself. It wants to be good like somebody else. But India has that unique, unique quality which nobody else has. In a way, in a way, we've come full circle after uh, after uh, repudiating the idea of India's uniqueness. You yourself have affirmed it in a roundabout way that yes. we do, after all, have something which nobody else has. And I think on that optimistic note, uh, we can look forward to a better future. And I do believe that uh, the data suggests that we will also be very close to eliminating poverty over the next uh, 10, 15, even 20 years if we continue to grow at a certain pace. And like an advanced society, we have 7 or 10% of our population as being poor, but most of the rest will be lifted out of poverty. In fact, in my own lifetime, I've seen, you know, from being 70, 80% poor to being like 30% or 37% poor, depending on how you define that. And there are many other changes that we see in our own lifetime. You have seen more than I have, but uh, we are very glad that we could uh, hear you, even if we don't see you. But next time, we want to see and hear you. And uh, we would also be very interested in inviting both you and Lady Kishwar Desai to what used to be the Vice Regal Lodge, because she runs a partition museum, and the Radcliffe line was drawn, that blood-soaked line, which is a star on the face of uh, the planet, has been drawn hereabouts. Yeah. Yeah. So in in post-COVID times, we invite both of you to the Indian Institute of Advanced Study, and I'm very grateful that despite uh, being all by yourself and not having any technical assistance, you still could join us. And I want to thank all our fellows. I wish everyone a very happy holiday season. And also, please remain COVID-free. All of you, I'm proud to say not a single of our fellows during this difficult period has had COVID. And I pray and I uh, 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 honestly and earnestly urge all of us to take the precaution so that uh, our fellows return to us after the break uh, in, in better health or as good health as we uh, bid them goodbye and uh, Godspeed and au revoir. So thank you. Thank you, Lord Bisa. Thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of the day and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, as you say, and uh, look forward to seeing you. And uh, hopefully, I hope I'm completely wrong and India, India will be the power of the 21st century. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, so much. thank you all. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.